Welcome back, everybody. I hope you all had a wonderful spring break. Apparently, people are excited to be back. It's spring here in Illinois, which is pretty exciting. Keep your eyes out. One of these days, you're going to wake up, and there's going to be leaves on all the trees. Every year, I tell myself, I'm going to notice. I'm paying attention this year. And then every year, it's always a surprise. So it's kind of cool. All right. So what are we doing here in CS125? So today, we're going to finish up our discussion about linked lists. That's sort of where we left off last time. So we've begun this discussion of data structures and algorithms, which is going to consume us for the rest of the semester. We begun that uh, last week. We started to look at how to implement a list. So a list is this incredibly useful general purpose data structure. And it's a fun thing to do because it brings together some of the things that we're, we've been talking about. So we're in, we have two implementations of a common interface that are going to mean that both our lists are going to behave the exactly same way but we're looking at trade-offs in terms of how the lists are actually implemented internally. So the homework problems you've been doing for the last couple days have been focused on an array list. And then on Friday, right before break, we introduced a new way, a different way, to implement a list that has different trade-offs when compared with a list that's backed internally by an array. So that's what we're going to pick up today. You also have a midterm that starts tomorrow on object-oriented programming. You remember that? Vaguely, maybe? Um, so we'll cover, we'll talk a little bit about that at the end of class. Um, but we have uh, resources set up. I posted an announcement this morning. We're definitely going to help you get ready for that. I expect you guys to do very well. All right. So remember that the last couple homework problems, you've been building this general purpose uh, data structure. This is sort of a generalization of an array. It's like an array, but it has properties that typical arrays don't have. It can grow and shrink in size. Um, that's kind of the main thing. Right? That in, uh, in arrays in Java are fixed size. I have to know the size when I start solving my problem. In contrast, the list can change size dynamically as your program runs. So that's incredibly nice. Like an array, a list imposes order on data. So again, it's easy to forget this. When we talk about trees starting on Wednesday, we're going to see an even more interesting way of structuring data. But arrays and lists, even though you, know, you might think, eh, OK, I'm just putting things in order, that is data structure. That's adding structure to data. So we're putting things in order. Both arrays and lists are data structures that do this. So the array interface, sorry, the list interface looks something like an array. I can get and set values at any index. Um, but it also adds these, like I said, these features that arrays don't have. So I can add items to the list, which causes its size to increase. I can remove items from the list, which causes its size to shrink. And I can do that at any point. So I can insert things into the middle of the list. I can also add at either end. And I can remove uh, from similar places. And again, lists are one of these data structures that are so useful. You find them built into a lot of modern programming languages because they are so useful, right? Um, a lot of places, you know, um, like JavaScript, Python, even, you know, things like Go. I mean, you very rarely deal with an array that has all of these limitations that we've been talking about. Normally, what you're going to deal with is a list. Some languages call them lists. Other languages call them other things. Go calls them slices. But uh, essentially, what they are is a list, right? Because that limitation of an array that it's only uh, fixed size turns out to be a real problem uh, when we try to solve a lot of different problems. All right. So the reason we're talking about these two different implementations and the reason that you're going to have a chance to implement both is because we want to talk about trade-offs. So whenever we see the same data structure implemented in two different ways, which is what we're doing, we have one interface, our simple list interface, and you guys are going to implement it two different ways. Whenever that happens, there's a reason for this. It's not just because this is some sort of academic exercise. Each implementation is good at something and not as good at other things. And depending on how you're using the data structure, you may find that one implementation performs better the other performs worse. But it really depends on the problem you're solving. But the reason that there are multiple out there in the world is because there are trade-offs between how these things are implemented. Again, if there was one list that was just good at everything, that had O1 performance for add, remove, insert, get, and set, then we would just use that. We'd be done. But we don't have that. Instead, we have two different lists, neither one of which is perfect, but either one of which might be a perfect fit for your problem, depending on how you use this particular data structure. So we're going to look at this with lists, and then we're going to come back and look at this with other data structures as well. So we have two different lists. So we have lists that we've backed with an array. Those have great lookups and stores. So load and store from the array, get and set, 
essentially the equivalent of bracket notation on the array, is very fast. Those are O1 operations. But when I actually want to stick something into the middle of that array, I've got a lot of work to do because I've got to move stuff all over the place. I've got to push a bunch of items, you know, in one direction or, or pull a bunch of items in the other direction. And so that creates a lot of overhead for doing these types of modifications. The list we're talking about today that stores things internally by linking different objects together using object references into something we call as a linked list, that has an interesting property where certain insertions are fast. It depends on where you're putting things in the list. Um, but lookups are slow. So if I want to get something out of the list, if I'm asking it what's the value at item, you know, n, that can be a slow operation. But adding things to the front or back, fast, a one, right? So again, trade-offs. All right, and these also present different memory usage trade-offs that we'll come back to in a little bit. All right, so to review, here is our list interface that you guys are working with, our simple list interface. We've boiled it down to just the bare essentials. These are the things that a list has to be able to do, and we've cut out all of the other stuff that you will find in the official Java list interface. So there is an official Java list interface. You guys can go check it out. If you come up with a clever way to implement a list that has some different trade-offs, by all means, implement the official Java list interface and publish your code somewhere. Maybe somebody will use it. But this is what we're going to be doing because it's, again, it's boiled down to just the things the list has to be able to do. So in order to use a list, I need to be able to get and set the elements. That's the operations that it shares with an array. Um, as I pointed out last time, those are functions. They're not, yeah, I, I'm not using bracket notation here. I can't do that. There are other languages that allow you to get away with this. So for example, in Python, any Python object, can, you can use bracket notation and you can implement it yourself. And as a result, you can do all sorts of really weird and terrible things. But in Java, we can't do that, so we essentially have to use these functions. I have get and set uh, that take the place of the array bracket notation and allow me to modify or retrieve elements at a particular index. I also have add and remove. So these are the things that we're essentially adding to the underlying features that the arrays that we are familiar with already provide. And then I need a size function. And that's really useful when I iterate over the list. There's a lot of times where I want to iterate over a list using a similar approach to what I would use for an array, I have to be able to figure out how large it is. And again, we call this size because the official Java list interface calls it size, I don't know why. If you wanted to make it more similar to strings and to arrays, you could just call it length. But size is what's used by the official list interface. So that's what we're gonna use. So, so for the, the week before spring break, we talked about how to implement this interface. So remember, this is good review about interfaces. This is the contract that our implementations have to abide by. They need to provide these five functions, that's the first thing, with the right signatures, and those functions have to do the thing described in the interface documentation. Again, this is a nice review for the midterm coming up this week. An interface is a contract between people that are gonna use your implementation and the implementation itself. So get should get the object that has been stored at this index. If get does something else, even though you've implemented the interface according to Java, you haven't implemented according to the specification. So I can write a dummy list class that implements these and just does random things or nothing that doesn't conform to the interface specification. It will compile and run, but anyone who's using your code will be very frustrated because they'll be saying, look, I, I sent, you know, I created this list, I added things to it, and then I called get and you gave me back some random garbage. That's not what this says you're supposed to do. So set is supposed to alter the element at that index, and then add and remove have documentation that's supposed to describe what they are going to do. So you guys have, have at this point, actually, last week, you finished implementing this for an array list. You guys built all those functions, right? And remember, for an array list, the get and set were extremely simple. Essentially, they were just pass-throughs that just ended up using bracket notation to retrieve the element from the underlying array once you had determined that the index was safe. Add and remove turned out to be more work. Those required you to do more because you had to modify the size of the underlying array, and so there's things that had to be copied around and such, right? And so that's, that's something to, to think about as we talk about linked lists, right? The array list implementations for getting set were quite simple. Add and remove were more involved. Um, size is always pretty easy. All right, so. Where we left off on Friday was we started to talk about another way to implement this interface. 
And that way uses an approach, this is sometimes known as a linked list. So rather than storing the elements in an array internally, this implementation is going to store the elements in order by linking them together using object references. So here's the inner class that our linked list implementation is going to use to store each item that's been put into the list. So you'll see that this item has two references that are instance variables. One is a value, and that refers to an object. That's the thing I put into the list. That's the thing I want to store in the list. Remember, I'm bringing structure to data. So this is the data that I'm bringing structure to. The other thing in here is a reference to an item called next. And so in a linked list, every item knows what its next item is. It doesn't know anything else. It knows, well, actually, it knows two things. It knows what value is stored at this position, and it knows what the next item in the list is. That's it. There's no index, so the item doesn't need to know what index it's at at the list. The item doesn't know where the start of the list is. The item doesn't know if it is the start of the list, or if it is, you know, one thing it, it can figure out is if it's the end of the list, because if it's the end of the list, next is going to be null. Yeah. Python has a built-in list, right? But you can implement this in Python using Python classes. You wouldn't do that, because you would just use Python's built-in list implementation. I don't know how Python lists are implemented internally, right? But if I was you, I wouldn't, I would, I would maybe find out, um, but I wouldn't necessarily do this. But you could do this in Python. Any, any language that has objects allows you to do this, right? I create an object class, and one of the fields on it refers to the next item in the list, and the other field refers to the, um, the value itself. I think, maybe, I can't remember what you guys end up doing when you go on to 225 and 241, but you will, I, I have a strong suspicion, in fact, I'm almost certain I'm correct about this, you will see these again, a linked list. This turns out to be a very useful data structure. C and C++, you know, C++, if you use libraries, you can get something that's like a list, but C, as a language, is very old, doesn't have a built-in list either. And so one of the ways to implement a list in C is to use a linked list. That's pretty common. Good question. But again, all each item knows is the value that's stored at that location, although it has no idea what location it is. It doesn't know if it's index 10 or index 1,000, and it knows what the next item in the list is. That's it. Okay? So how do I use this to create a list? Well, one thing I need to know, one thing that my wrapper class, the actual list class is going to have to store, is a reference to the start, to the first element. So if you look at our linked list class that we're going to start to implement together, all it stores is a reference to the first element in the list. As long as I know where to start, then I can follow the references from one item to another to get to any item in the list that I want to access. And here's how things end up looking. So here's a list that I built by adding new items to the front. This is potentially the simplest way to add items to a list. What am I doing every time? So this is tricky, right? Let's, let's walk through this together. So the first time, this is, this, you, can, you can think of this as start, right? This is the start of my list. I create a new item. The value that I'm storing is zero. This is the data that I'm storing in my data structure. And the next reference at that point in the list is null. This is the first item. So now I've got items, and if I go back, oops, that's forward. If I go back here, when I start off, now my list has one item in it. When I add a new item to the list, this is sort of compressed to fit on the slide. So what's happening here is I'm creating a new item where the next reference is items. When this line starts to run, items refers to item zero. So when item eight is created, its next reference refers to item zero. Items gets the new reference that's created by the creation of this object, and so when I'm finished, what I have is something that looks like this. So now I have a list with two elements in it. Items refers to the item with value eight, and its next reference now refers to the item with value zero. Its next reference still refers to null. Notice that I didn't change anything about item zero when I added this new item to the front. Sometimes you do, 
you guys will have to implement some operations on linked lists where you do have to change things around in the middle of the list, like if I wanted to insert something. We'll come back and look at that operation later in class. All right, so let's do this again. Now I'm adding a new item to the front, so same thing. When this line starts to execute, items refers to item eight. So as item five is being created, its next reference refers to the item with value eight. And then items is then reset or updated to refer to the new item that I created with value five. So one thing I wanna just pause and point out here is that these, you know, so you look at these items and they're all kind of next to each other on the slide. These items could be anywhere in your computer's memory. So the fact that they're in order is just sort of an artifact of how I created this slide. One could be there, another one could be there, another one could be there. And I could imagine, you know, creating a linked list of students in this room, right? If I went around and I gave each, a bunch of you a, a piece of paper that had the name of another student on it, right? So then I could go to one person and I could say, okay, who's the next student in the list? And they would say some name and I would call that out and I'd figure out where that person was and I'd go over there and they would have uh, you know, a piece of paper with the name of, an, of another student, right? So they don't have to be next to each other. Typically they aren't next to each other. That's just how it looks. All right, so here's our, the beginnings of our simple link, link list class. Remember we're using this inner class here to store the item that wraps the values that get inserted into the list and adds the next reference to them. That's simply because nobody outside this list needs to see this. If you go back to our, and look at our list interface, which is right here, none of these, um, none of these functions return an item or take an item as a reference. So this item class is completely hidden from the user of the interface. If you use a simple linked list, you don't have to care about how it's implemented. That's one of the things that's nice about interfaces. Because, for example, if this was an array list, you could use it in the same way, and there would be no item class because I would store things internally using an array. All right, so let's look at add to front, right? So this is what we've been doing so far. And this is something that we'll give you when you, we ask you, starting tomorrow, to start working on operations on linked lists. So all I'm doing here, this is a very, very simple operation, okay? What I'm doing here is I'm saying I have, I store the start, of the list, that's all that the simple linked list class needs to store. When I add an item to the front, I create a new item with the past value. Its next reference gets whatever start is. So it, the next item in the list is whatever the previous start of the list was. And then I set start to that new value. All right, so this is pretty nice, actually. Um, Let's, so let's look at this from a performance perspective. So this is a special case of add. If I add any word to the list, it turns out that the performance of a linked list starts to not be so great. But if I add to the front, now we get a chance to review some of our big O analysis. Okay, so can anybody identify N, right? That's always our first step when we're doing, you know, a big O analysis. What is the feature here that drives performance? What's the thing that controls how many times the loop executes, or whatever? Can anyone see it? Yeah. There's no loop. There's, and so, so there is no N in this problem. Right, so in theory, when we look at other problems on linked lists, N is gonna be the length of the list, but for this particular operation, this is constant time. There's no loop. All I'm doing is creating a new item and modifying a reference. That's it. So, this is kind of cool, right? Remember, array lists, when I add things anywhere, there's a special case at the end in certain cases, but in general, when I add things to an array list, what was the runtime of that? Anybody remember? All the way before break, you've had so much fun since then, forgot all about this stuff. Yeah. It was O-N, because I had to move a bunch of stuff around in the array. If it's at the front, I've got to take every element in the array and ship them all over by one, so I've got a loop in there. If it's at the end, I've got to create a new array, I've still got to copy everything from the original array, right? So the way that we had you implement um, add, it was O-N for an array list. Here, it's O-1. That's pretty cool. So there's something good about a linked list, but there's a catch one of the things about linked lists that we're gonna have to start to think about. So, 
what about if I want to access an item in the list? So we talked about this for array lists. It was super easy. All I had to do was take n and use it as an index, or index in this case, and use it as an index into my array. What am I going to have to do here? Hopefully this is not that hard, but I'm going to have to do a little bit more work. How am I going to figure out what the nth element of the list is? Someone who hasn't contributed today. David. Yeah. So remember, my list, you see an array in there? No. All my list class stores is the reference to the start of the list. That's it. So that's all I know. All I know is, where was the first item in the list? I don't know, I don't have a reference to the second item, or the third item, or the tenth item. All I have is reference to the first item. How do I get to those other items? I have to walk the list. That's exactly the right terminology that David used. So I've got to start at the beginning. Let's, so let's say this is my list. All my simple link class has is this reference. It doesn't store a reference to item one. So if I want to retrieve the second the item at index two, I've got to start at the first item in the list, at index zero, and I've got to walk that many times. So I start at item, the item with value three here, and I walk forward two times in this case. And now I can retrieve, I can return the value at that spot in the list. So, now we can do this using a for loop. I'm going to show you how to do this in a minute. This is one of those for loops. You know, you guys now know how to write a for loop to iterate over an array. That's a useful for loop. One of the other useful for loops, particularly when you're doing more systems programming in lower level languages, is a for loop that walks a linked list that follows items from one reference to another. I'm going to show you how to do that in a second. So that's another very useful for loop. You guys are going to have to use this to solve several of the homework problems this week, because that's one of the downsides of linked lists. Whenever I want to figure out what the value of an item is at a particular location, or I want to make some modification to the list, let's say I want to insert an item or remove an item, I have to get to that spot on the list first. And getting there is slow. Getting there involves a loop. All right, so let's, let's do this problem together. I've got a simple linked list. Um, this is sort of the beginnings of what you guys are going to be working on the homework problems this week. I have a constructor that takes an array and essentially calls add to front. It goes through the array backwards, calls add to front on every item. So essentially what I end up with is a list with the same elements in the array in the same order. And again, I accomplish this by adding them to the front in reverse order. All right, so there's my add to my constructor. I've got an add to front method that is implemented exactly how we just described. And now I want to, I want to print every item in the list. So how am I going to do that? So I know I need some kind of loop. All right, so let's start with that. Now inside the loop, what I want to be able to do is essentially print the value. I've got a sticky key on my MacBook now. This is really making me, uh, annoying me. At least it's the semicolon key, so that's like not the worst. Um, all right. But how do I do this? Where do I start? Let's just talk it through. What's the first element that I should start with? Let's scroll up a little bit. Well, actually, I don't need to. You can see it right here. So my list stores the start, okay? So I want to, um, I want to start at start. How do I advance? So when I used an index into an array, I advanced by just doing index plus plus. How do I advance here? It's a little trickier. So what is start? Start's a reference to an item, right? Given an item, how do I get to the next item? 
scroll up a little bit and show you what's up here. There's my item class. So what's the one thing that an item knows other than the value stored? Yeah. I know how to get to the next item. So I'm going to advance, advance by using item.next. And when do I stop? So essentially I'm outlining the three parts of the for loop. I have an initialization. I need to have a way to go forward. When do I stop? With an array, I stopped when I got to the end of the array by checking how large the index was against the length of the array. What do I do here? How do I know that I've reached the end of the array? Yeah. Yeah, so when I get to a null reference, I'm done. I've walked off the end of the list. So stop when we reach null. Okay, so let's do this. So I need a temporary variable for my, I, I need a loop variable. That loop variable is going to be an item reference. I'm gonna call that current. That's the current item reference that I'm looking at. And I'm gonna initialize it to start. I'm gonna stop when it's null. So I'm gonna continue as long as that reference is not null. Okay, so I've got my initialization, I have my check, and then I'm gonna say current is equal to current.next. That's it. That is my canonical for loop to walk a list. That's it. Start at the start. The temporary variable I maintain in an array, it's the index. Here, it's the current item. So I have my current item start by referring to the start. I continue as long as it's not null, and I update it by advancing it to whatever the next reference is on that item. Okay, so let's, let's, let's think about some cases here. What happens if start is null? What does that mean, first of all? If start is null, what does that mean about the list? Yeah. Empty, bingo. Start is null, I've got no elements. So what happens here if start is null, so I initialize current to start, so current's gonna start out being null, and then I check. Remember, I run the check condition every time I enter the loop. So if current is, starts out being null, the loop never executes. And that's what should happen, because there's no list to walk. All right? Let's, let's think a little bit about what happens when I get to the end of the list. So at some point, I'm gonna have a reference to an item where its next reference is null. So let's just walk through what happens at that point. So at that point, its value should not be null, so I can still print the value, but then I go up to the top of the loop, I update it by setting current is equal to current.next. At that point, current is now null. I've reached the end of the list, but I check the condition before I enter. So this condition that says current not equals to null ensures that whenever I enter the body of the loop, I have a valid reference to an item. And so I can't walk off the end of the loop. So this is going to be safe. All right, so let's try this. There you go. Let's try making sure that I don't die if I have an empty loop. That's good. How about a loop with an array with just one item? Let's try adding some additional items here. Seems to work. Questions about this? David. Yeah, so it's a great question. So the, so the question is, can I use the size function to bound my loop? You can, but then you have to maintain another index, right? So then I have to count as I go along, right? Now, there, there are some cases where you're gonna end up needing to do this. So I'm not gonna do this problem because it's coming up on the homework, but for example, you might wanna think about how would I modify this example to be able to do something like get the value at a particular index. That's something that, again, is trivial with an array list, is a little more complicated with a linked list. So I've got this loop that I can use to iterate through the array. I just need to make some small modifications so I know where I am, right? I need to know that, oh, I'm on item four, I should stop. Or I need to know, uh-oh, I got to the end of the list and there is no item eight. So with an array, even before I index into the array, I can check to make sure the index is valid. With the list, if you maintain the size, you can do that. 
But if you don't, you might actually have to walk to the end of the list to find out, oh wait, there is no item eight. There's only seven items in this list. It's a great question. Other questions about this? This is one of those things where you, if you can start to understand this stuff, you're really starting to internalize how references work, and you're gonna be really well prepared for 225, 241, and those downstream courses, right? Particularly 225. On some level, data structures become all about reference manipulation. You call them pointers when you get to C++, but they're basically the same thing, except they're less safe. Don't get me started. Yeah. No, right. Okay, so great question. So the, the question is, shouldn't start be static? Let's see what would happen. I want to be able to create different lists, right? So let's do this. So now, if I print another list, I get this, correct? And if I print my list, I get the expanded number of elements, right? Let's see what happens if I make start static. That's interesting. So what just happened there? So now I have one, I only have one list in the entire system. And so anytime I add anything to the list, it gets added to that one. Great, good, good question. So yeah, this is the place where we can see kind of what happens with, with the static when, when I, I don't want just one list, right? I wanna be able to create as many different list instances as I want. Each one of them maintains its own internal structure. Yeah, good question. Good preparation for tomorrow's mentor. Okay, awesome. So here's where things get hairy. All right, and again, these, these are these like, so, these are so, these, these are, Fun problems, they're classic interview questions. How do I insert something into a linked list? So adding things to the front, not a problem. Walking the thing, okay, I got that. That's like one line of code. Um, how do I put things into this list? All right, so let's, let's talk about that a little bit. So here's how our algorithm's going to work. The first thing we need to do is we need to find the right spot in the list. All right, so that's important. So I need to have some way to find the right element. And the right element may not be the one that you think. So this is the first thing I need to do. Then, I have this new item. I need to, in order to make sure that it ends up in the right spot, I need to find the preceding item, and I need to update its next reference to refer to my new item, okay? So at that point, I've got the item in the right spot but I have a problem, which is that I've detached the rest of the list. So that item initially has a next pointer of null, which refers to nothing, right? So I've inserted the item in the right place, but now I've truncated the rest of the list. So the last thing I need to do is set the reference on the new item to refer to whatever the rest of the list was. That ensures that I end up with the item in the right spot without detaching a bunch of elements in the list. Okay. Obviously, we have a picture here, because th that doesn't make any sense if we just talk it through. I've thought about this a million times, so it makes sense to me, but let's look at it um, schematic. All right, so let's say I wanna put a new item with value seven into this list at index one. So when I'm done, what do I want to happen? I want, this is currently the item with index one. When I'm done, item seven should be here, and these items should have moved. So that's something important to understand with insert. That's the difference between insert and set. Set is easier, because I can just get to the right spot and change the value of that item. With insert, the size of the list should go up by one. And so the item that's currently in index one becomes index two, the item that's currently in index two becomes index three. Okay, so let's walk through how to do this. So I want it to go there. But in order to get it there, I have to find the preceding item. So this is what's tricky. If I walk to the place I want it to go, I've gone too far, because the reference I need to change is on the preceding item in the list. So now, here's how this looks. Two steps. So I set the next reference on the preceding item to my new item. So again, at this point, item seven is now at index one. The problem is, the rest of the list is hanging off in space. It's disconnected. And so to finish the job, I need to set the next reference on item seven to refer to the rest of the list. All right, let's, walk the, let's watch that again. 
in slow motion, maybe a little faster motion, okay. Walk to the right item, take my new item, set the next reference on the preceding item to that new item, set the next reference on the new item to the rest of the list. And now I have done what I wanted. You guys have a chance to do that this week on the homework. Again, classic problem, right? Really forces you to think about how references work and making sure that you keep stuff around. It's very easy to get to a point, if you're trying to solve this problem, where you've got here, but you have no reference to item eight. And if you have no reference to item eight, you know what Java's gonna do, it's gonna find that item and destroy it. Right, so it's gonna be garbage collected. All right. Okay, so I'm not gonna go over the implementation of that, obviously, because you guys are gonna do it this week. Um, I have a couple more mo notes on lists, and then we'll talk about the midterm for a couple of minutes. Okay, so what we've been talking about so far is something that's called a singly linked list. Why is it called a singly linked list? Because every item has one link to another item in the list. Typically, a singly linked list has a link to the next item. That way I can start at the start and walk forward in the list. Obviously, if you want it to be strange, you could create a list that had a reference to the end, and every item had a previous reference, and I could walk it backwards. And you could get everything to work. I don't know why you would do that, um, but it's, it's possible. There's also something called a doubly linked list. In a doubly linked list, what changed, right? So, sorry, let me go back here. So here's my singly linked list, here's my doubly linked list. If I look at that class definition, what have I added? I've added a single reference to my item. So now, every item knows three things. It knows the value at that position, it knows the next item in the list, and it knows the previous item in the list. And this can be useful in certain cases because it allows me to walk the list either forward or backward. So given a node in the list, I can walk in one direction, I can walk in the other direction. In my singly linked list that I just showed you, I can't go backwards, I can only go forwards. In a doubly linked list, I can go in either direction. So here's an example of a doubly linked list class. I'm storing both the start and the end. I can start at the end and I can walk this way, I can start at the start, and I can walk this way. And there are certain cases in which this is something that you might want to consider using. I just wanted you to see it. Okay, so we've, we've talked, and we'll come back and, and talk about this again, but we've talked a little bit about the performance trade-offs. And you guys are gonna, you guys are gonna see these in action as you implement them. To me, that's one of the best, I mean, we, I can put up a, a table with all the O, O1, ON for all these operations, but by, when you guys implement it, sit down and have to see that there's a loop in there, that's gonna really sort of bring the point home, all right? But there's also another trade-off between these two um, implementations. So we talked about the fact that mainly when we talk about trade-offs between different implementations, we're gonna be focused on performance. But there's also a space, a memory usage trade-off here as well. Because, if I think about it, so linked lists are, you know, faster for certain operations, but they consume more space, why? So if I look at my simple array list and I think about how it stores the references to the objects. So imagine every reference takes up one unit of space. I have an array of references, and if that array is exactly the size of the number of items in the list, how many units of storage does that array does that array list implementation consume? So let's say again, every reference consumes one unit of storage, I've got an array list that's storing n items, how much space am I using for the references for those items? It's not a hard question. Yeah, n, one unit per reference, I've got n references, because this array, as I add and remove items, will expand or contract to fit the number of items that are in the list. What about my doubly linked list? So with my doubly linked list, for each item, I'm also storing an object reference, but I'm storing two other references. I've got a reference to the next item, and I've got a reference to the previous item. So again, if every reference consumes some amount of space, call it one unit, and my, simply, my doubly linked list has n elements in it, how much space is it taking up?
Yeah. 3n. Here I've got one reference per value in the list. Here I've got three references per value. I've got a reference for the value itself, but I need to also store references to the previous and the next item. In Java, all those references consume roughly the same amount of space. So, so again, I've got this trade-off here, right? So not only does the linked list uh, perform slower for certain operations, but it also consumes more space to store the same amount of information. So again, to store n integers or n values, my array list is gonna take n amount of space, my linked list will take 3n. For this implementation, if it was a doubly linked list, sorry, if it was a singly linked list, it would take 2n. But my doubly linked list takes 3n, because it stores both the next and the previous reference. All right, so, we are done with lists. On Friday, we're gonna, uh, sorry, Friday. I guess we're skipping Wednesday. Um, on Wednesday, we're gonna talk about trees, which are a really fun data structure, and it's gonna allow us to start talking about a new programming technique called recursion which is, I think, the next big conceptual challenge that you have in front of you in this class. There were some bits of object-oriented programming that were probably a little tough on your brain. Recursion is really gonna freak you out a little bit. It's super fun once you get used to it, uh, but it takes some getting used to it, and we will start that process on Wednesday. But let's summarize what we've learned about lists. So, what is the runtime to insert an item at the front of an array list? So add to the front. This is very much the kind of thing that could appear like on a quiz or something. Yeah. It's O-N in the general case. So I've gotta move everything around. I've gotta take all those other items in the array and copy them over, I've got a loop in there. You guys implemented this. What about a linked list? Special case, insert at the beginning. Oh, one, yes. And there are, you know, again, you may wonder, like, why do we care about this? There are certain algorithms that only ever modify the front of the list. So if you have an algorithm that only ever needs to add things to the front of a list and remove from the front of the list, sometimes that's called a stack, then your algorithm will run really fast using a linked list, because you're like, I don't care about the performance for getting an item from the middle of the list. I never do that. All I do is I add or remove stuff to the front. Both those operations on linked lists, constant time. All right. What about getting set for an array list? Again, we love this operation. It's just an array index. We know that that's a one. Linked list, you guys are gonna implement this, but give me your best guess. Yeah. O N. I gotta find it. I have to start from the beginning, I have to walk. Sometimes if the index is small, I only have to go a couple of steps, but sometimes if the index is large, I have to go all the way to the end. So in general, Sometimes it's small, sometimes it's big, average is n over two, we drop the over two because this is 125, not 173, um, and we're left with O-N. All right, insert anywhere. So again, an array list, in general, insertion performance is O-N, a linked list, it's also O-N. And you guys will see why when you do this. The main problem with the linked list is that in order to insert somewhere, I have to find it. The general case of finding an element in a linked list is O-N. The special case of finding it at the front is O-1. I can also make finding the back O-1 as well if I store a separate reference in my wrapper class to the end of the list. Okay, awesome. Questions about lists? We're done with lists. You're gonna see them on homework throughout the week. Our first tree homework problem won't be till Friday, so you guys are gonna have several days to enjoy implementing the linked list um, implementation, which is a lot of fun, um, and then we're gonna move on to trees. So any questions about this before we go on? Yeah. Great question. Is either type of list more common? Um, I do not know. I think they are both fairly common, right? I would, I would suspect that, I think linked lists the idea of linking things together in order to group them into a unit and be able to find one is pretty common, right? They're not always used like a list, but there's a lot of cases like in, in certain, you know, implementations of things where things do end up getting linked together, right? So that idiom is very common, right? Yeah, good question. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so it really depends on the problem you're solving. So let's go back to this, this table. 
if you have a sense of, so let's say you have an algorithm that uses a list, right? The thing you need to do is look at that algorithm and map its usage of the list down onto this table. So if your algorithm does a lot of um, gets and sets from arbitrary locations in the list but doesn't change the size very often, it can run very fast on an array list. If your algorithm does a lot of operations at the front of the list, where it's constantly pushing, and we sometimes we call this push and pop with the stack, adding and removing elements at the very front, right, then a linked list might be a better fit. It really depends on how the algorithm works and how it uses the list, right? Uh, we have a couple, there's some, there's some fun quiz questions that always trip people up a little bit, where we're essentially what we're gonna do is we're gonna give you uh, some run times for an algorithm. We're gonna ask you to try to figure out what list uh, implementation it's used based on the operation. Okay, I wanna talk about the midterm for a couple minutes. So the midterm is, again, not something to get super stressed about, it's just another quiz. I actually realized today the midterms are actually worth a little bit less than the quizzes are, uh, because you can drop quizzes. Um, so typical structure, you guys have seen before, it's cumulative. Two different things about the midterm, it's cumulative and you can't drop it, you gotta take it. So 10 four point multiple choice questions, these are all from previous quizzes, and then three 20 point programming problems, all of them will have some uh, amount of partial credit available. So here is, and, and you know, again, I'm, 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 I think you guys are doing great. I'm a little concerned about this midterm because we had break, and we also, before break, we had a week to already talking about data structures and algorithms. So here is the, um, the range of lectures to look at. At this point, all of the quiz material that you guys will need to see is up on the 125 problem set, so you can, that to, you can use that to practice. But essentially, the stuff we started the week before break is not on the midterm. All of it is object-oriented programming, including polymorphism, interfaces, you know, class design, blah, 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 all that good stuff. All right, we have uh, two minutes, so let me uh, do a couple of uh, reminders. Oh, yeah, so you guys, the, the class is doing really well, right? So I'm not that concerned about the midterm. Again, it's not that big of a deal in terms of points. Um, but remember, the point of these assessments is to get you to do the homework. If you do the homework, I'm happy and you guys are doing the homework and, and, and practicing for stuff, so that's awesome. Let me do announcements, and if we have 30 seconds left, I'll take one or two questions about the midterm, because there's a couple of these. Um, midterm starts tomorrow. You have to take this. You cannot drop it. If you don't take it, there will be two percentage points missing from your grade. Um, to help you review, we are not going to have labs this week on Tuesday and Wednesday. Instead, we'll have drop in office hours in 0403 if you want to come down and get some help. Um, so, I have not been able to get to my Monday office hours, so I'm just gonna cancel those for the rest of the semester. I'm still doing the Wednesday, Friday ones. Um, important note about the MP. So there's an MP coming out later in the week. We're not gonna drop it during the midterm. Um, this is a hard MP, so, so gear up. I hope you guys are well rested. All right, questions about the midterm, in the back. Can't hear you, come up front. All right, I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Have a fantastic day. Good luck on the midterm.